Well, welcome everyone. You're at the uh, Coffee Science Seminar Series and today we're going to hear about fertilizer nitrogen in a net zero world, perspectives from broadacre cropping. Uh, we have the next slide. I'm Robert Henry. I'm Professor of Innovation in Agriculture in Coffee, and I'm the facilitator for today's seminar. The next slide, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I think the next slide uh, is some housekeeping. Today's seminar is scheduled from 12 till 1. And uh, if you have questions you'd like to answer, uh, save them till the end and use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, not the chat button and we'll address them at the conclusion of the seminar. Uh, the next slide uh, introduces Professor Mike Bell. Uh, Mike holds the Chair in Tropical Agronomy at the UQ Gatton campus. He joined Coffee in 2010 after 30 years in Queensland DAF, based at Kingaroy. He has led regional and national soils and crop nutrition projects in the grains, sugar and cotton industries and currently leads a national project quantifying nitrogen cycling and loss in the Australian grains industry. He's also involved in developing national nitrous oxide emission factors for crop residues and in a national project testing the efficacy of new fertiliser technology on the nitrogen use efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, I, I think we've got a, a, a very well qualified presenter to talk on the topic today. And I'll hand over to you, Mike, to uh, present your seminar. Thanks, Robert. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants. Um, welcome to the seminar today. Um, and I'd like to, I think hopefully it'll give you an introduction to a lot of the FET sitting that people working in my space tend to do when they're trying to marry um, the demands of productive agricultural, agricultural systems with the environmental impacts um, that are concurrent or occurring concurrently and trying to balance the, the often conflicting needs of both systems. So fertiliser nitrogen and the greenhouse gas emissions that uh, are associated with it are a pretty hot topic at the moment. So by way of background, um, cropping systems around the world are under pressure. Uh, we've all seen the graphs of population increase in the next or projected population increase in the next 30 years. And associated with that is a world food demand that's expected to increase by 70 to 80% along with an increased demand for protein in diets. Now, the figure at the bottom would, would show that uh, these are Australia's expectations of how we will contribute to meeting that um, increased food supply to feed the world. And you can see that the red bars would suggest that we're going to do a lot of heavy lifting in that space with um, wheat production as an example of cropping where our productivity is expected to increase by something like 50%. I guess the question that we're, we have been wrestling with for a number of years now is can cropping systems rise to these productivity challenges? We all know in Australian cropping systems that water availability determines crop productivity in Australia. Um, Substantial yield increases have occurred nationally and regionally. The top graph is the, the classic showing the wheat productivity over, the over time uh, in Southern Australia. And the middle figure here indicates the decadal changes in productivity of wheat and sorghum that have occurred up to 2000 on the Darling Downs. 
So particularly in the case of sorghum, you can see productivity has increased something like sixfold in response to a combination of genetics and agronomic or farming systems improvements. But if we look at it, Australia against the rest of the world in the bottom graph here, you can see the, the average productivity uh, of cereal grains in the red line is the rest of the world and the blue is Australia. And you can see for the last 20 years at least, our national productivity has tended to be fairly stagnant with ups and downs due to moisture availability. So if we're gonna meet increased food production targets, um, do we bring more area into cropping or do we go for more intensive production? I guess the top figure shows that we have had a significant shift in land use in mainly Southern Australia, where um, mixed cropping land or pastures have been converted into crop land. So the red indicates declining area of, of, um, of pastures through to about the 2013, 2014. And you can see the concomitant in, smaller increase in cropped area that's occurred over the same time. But when we actually, you can see that cropped area has plateaued for about, since about 2000. And you can see that in the bottom figure there where we looked at, where we can see that whilst productivity has increased, the, the uh, green line at the top, the area that that productivity is being derived from has plateaued. So essentially, we're looking at intensifying our production systems uh, rather than increasing the, the cropping area or the cropping base. And continuing to intensify productivity brings a number of challenges. Australian cropping systems, in addition to water limitations, are increasingly nutrient limited, with N being a major component of that limitation. Uh, there are other secondary limits, and I've spent a lot of time working on phosphorus and potassium with our teams, which are the latter being an emerging limit, phosphorus being a widespread or a long-term limit in Australian production. But compared to nitrogen, um, they're relatively minor issues compared to the impact that nitrogen has on productivity. So declining nitrogen fertilizer, fertility of soils is due to a combination of factors. Um, declining soil organic matter and organic nitrogen reserves, which are present in cropland. Um, so as those reserves have declined, um, the ability of the soil to supply nitrogen to crops is reduced. We also have relatively low legume frequencies and particularly in Southern Australia, where we used to have a, a crop pasture lay system where people would alternate between cropping phases and and grazed legume-based pasture phases, a lot of those areas have now transitioned into continuous cropping. So again, less legumes in our cropping system. And also, as with the previous slides have shown, increased productivity of those systems. Now, one of the ways we've been able to increase that productivity is by increasing our fertilizer inputs. As these figures show on the, as the graph shows on the right-hand side, We've seen since about 2010, our fertiliser nitrogen inputs in grains cropping systems have increased by around about 35% um, over that time. So increasing nitrogen use and nitrogen use efficiency. Now, they these two terms, increasing end use and nitrogen use efficiency, are often perceived to be going in the opposite direction. Um, in the grains industry, Fertiliser nitrogen use tends to be conservative due to seasonal variability and lower returns on investment. So the wheat and sorghum crops that we're producing tend to be worth a little bit less per tonne um, than, for example, cotton and sugarcane. And so the cost of nitrogen versus the increased yield that you get out of it um, is often, people often target the 90% productivity uh, Ninety percent of potential productivity as a useful target in the grains industry. In crops like sugarcane and cotton, where they're potentially higher value crops and more profitable, high rates of applied nitrogen um, are driven by the need to maximise productivity. For example, people often target the ninety-five percent or even the hundred percent of potential yield. 
but they're also driven by loss risks and the low cost of nitrogen relative to the crop value. So particularly in a sugar environment where nitrogen losses in, in um, late fertilised crops going into the wet season can be very large, any reduction in nitrogen fertiliser rates has an um, almost immediate impact on productivity. So people tend to treat nitrogen a little bit like insurance to cover high loss seasons. And I guess the you can see that the yield response curves for some of those um, sugarcane returns in the bottom figure there are fairly flat. So people are putting a lot of nitrogen on to get a relatively small return and in increased cane yield. But economically, of course, that still stacks up. The important thing, though, is that all label nitrogen sources are vulnerable to environmental loss, particularly once that nitrogen is in the mineral nitrogen form. So what is the fate of fertilizer nitrogen that isn't taken up by the crop? I didn't want to terrify people by showing them a nitrogen cycle diagram again, but it's worth remembering that um, I've indicated the processes, the A, B, C's and D's, which indicate the, the fate of nitrogen that's not taken up by the crop. So once nitrogen is mineralized to ammonium and nitrate, it can be temporarily immobilized or incorporated into the soil organic matter pool which limits plant access and nitrogen movement in the short term. Secondly, mineral nitrogen can be permanently lost in runoff and drainage, as shown by the letters B, and, gas and gaseous loss forms either via denitrification in C or volatilization in D. So when we look at winter and summer cropping on the grains of uh, winter and summer grain cropping on clay soils a recent paper um, by Rollings et al um, used stable isotopes to, to do some precise quantification of nitrogen losses and fertilizer recovery by the crop particularly or primarily over a single growing season and you can see here we've got three nitrogen rates shown we're also showing data for um, trials that were done on research stations and trials that were done on farmer sites. The farmer sites tended to have a bit higher background nitrogen fertility than the research station sites in this instance. And the important thing to look at is that the crop nitrogen recovery decreases with increasing nitrogen rate. And in grains, the recovery ranged from anywhere between 20 and 50% of the applied nitrogen was taken up by the crop. That's not removed in grain, that's taken up by the crop. Probably two thirds of that nitrogen was removed in grain. Um, the other point to, to look at is that the losses, the losses are typically um, you know, of the order of 20 to 30%, irrespective of nitrogen rate and irrespective of whether that work was done on research stations or uh, on farmers fields. So there's some significant nitrogen losses out there in these grains industries, despite the relatively conservative nitrogen rates. Current GRDC investments are looking to quantify nitrogen cycling and loss in Australian, Australian grain systems more broadly and essentially building on that original work. There's a large national project running from um, funded from 2022 to 2026 um, the sites are indicated on the map here. They, they cover all mainland states. Um, there's 15 sites across the country located in the dominant soils and cropping systems um, of the industry in those regions. The GRDC have invested in a lot of 15N labelled urea to precisely quantify nitrogen cycling and loss in these systems. And the important, other important thing there is that we're looking at it over multiple seasons too. So we're tracking fertiliser nitrogen, not over a single season, but over two and three seasons. And a lot of the data that's been collected in this is being used to um, parameterize the soil nitrogen routine in, in APSIM to, so that we can actually extrapolate findings to other production areas and to have at least preliminary testing of nitrogen management scenarios on different soils and cropping systems. An example of the, some of the early data coming out of that project came from Gatton in 2022-23, where we're growing sorghum. Um, we had irrigated and dry land trials 
Our dryland trial received pretty fair in-crop rainfall of 240 millimetres. Our irrigated trial received an additional 150 mils over the season. And you could actually, of the different colours indicate nitrogen um, that was in the grain, in the stover, um, or in the, retained in the soil. And the light blue line below the zero there is indicating the nitrogen, fertiliser nitrogen that could not be accounted for at the end of that first growing season. So those losses um, represented between 35 and 50% of the applied nitrogen with the higher nitrogen tend to be in the wetter conditions, oh, sorry, the higher losses tend to, tending to be in the higher end rates and in the irrigated as opposed to the dry land production systems. I mentioned APSIM because this is an important part of this work is that APSIM um, currently doesn't simulate the lateralization loss, which is a really important loss pathway in Southern production systems where N is surface applied. And the simulation of total denitrification loss is not well tested. There's just not a lot of data sets that do more than monitor just N2O. It's also not well calibrated for things like banded fertilizer nitrogen applications, which um, again are pretty important in a lot of our cropping systems. There's a recent paper by Takeda et al. that's assessing the that has assessed the ability of the APSIM model to simulate fertilizer nitrogen dynamics in grain systems where denitrification was the major loss pathway. Um, and as you can see, he, there's two a figure here showing two attempts at predicting the fate of nitrogen in soil, plant, and loss, um, or the fate of fertilizer nitrogen either retained in the soil, taken up by the plant, or lost to the system. And with the conventional settings in, in the APSIM model, you can see that APSIM is over predicting the retention of nitrogen in soil. It's under predicting the fertilizer nitrogen taken up by the crop, and it's also under predicting the losses. By tweaking the, um, by calibrating the, the model to match crop nitrogen uptake and then playing around with mineralization and denitrification coefficients um, to try and get the best possible fit for fertilizer nitrogen recovery and loss. You can see there's some improvement in the bottom panel there, the, um, but we're still overestimating soil uh, fertilizer retention in soil. We're slightly under predicting plant recovery of fertilizer in, and we're also under predicting losses. So there's obviously a need to try and improve some of the coefficients and the nitrogen routines in APSIM to try and get better correlations with the data that we're seeing in these field experiments. So when we're talking about missing nitrogen, we're talking about three main loss pathways. We're talking about uh, leaching, which is essentially the movement primarily of nitrate with soil water deeper into the profile and out of the crop root zone. We're looking at volatilization, which is the loss of um, ammonia to the atmosphere, typically associated with surface applied fertilizer and particularly in lighter textured soils or when you've got high um, residue loads. So in other words, the fertilizer sits on the residue and doesn't contact the soil itself. In clay soils with high water holding capacity, denitrification is the main loss pathway. And that loss from denitrification can be either as N2 and N2O. And as I've said earlier, most of the work's been done on N2 because when you're in an atmosphere that's um, nearly 80% N2, it's pretty difficult to produce or to detect um, uh, additional N2 emissions um, from soils in field experiments. So fertilizer loss on greenhouse gas emissions, the different loss pathways have different greenhouse gas impacts. So nitrous oxide from mineralization, um, in other words, the, from going from ammonium to nitrate and also denitrification has a large impact as nitrous oxide has globing warm, warm, warming potential 270 to 290, depending on the paper that you cite, times that of CO2. So a small bit of nitrous oxide has a large impact on emissions. Losses of N2 during denitrification have no real impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Whilst they, a farmer feels the loss in his hip pocket, 
from inefficient use of fertilizer, if loss is as in two, there's no greenhouse gas impact other than the need to increase fertilizer rates to compensate for it. The lateralized ammonia, uh, again, ammonia isn't a greenhouse gas, but that ammonia can be redeposited in other parts of the landscape and then nitrified or denitrified. Um, and the same with nitrogen loss to leaching or runoff in receiving waters. So whilst we call those losses indirect losses, because it's it's not the primary loss pathway that's causing the emission, it's what happens to that nitrogen subsequently. Um, so the implications for meeting net zero emissions targets. So the production of synthetic fertilizer accounts for about 1.4% of national CO2 emissions. Um, and when you look at, say, the, the synthesis of urea, we're looking at a, an emissions of about 2.6 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of nitrogen um, synthesized. So 100 kilos of applied N, you're going to uh, uh, emit, or well, that the manufacturer of that fertilizer is going to cost you 260 kilos of CO2 equivalents. Inefficient use of fertilizer in will obviously increase emissions from nitrogen manufacture, uh, as well as lose money for producers. However, as we'll show as we go through this talk, post-application losses um, can dwarf these emissions from fertilizer in manufacture, especially if that loss is as N2O. And the bottom graphic here looks at the agricultural emissions, um, Australian agricultural emissions, which represent 14% of the national emissions. Uh, and you can see that nitrous oxide ac accounts for something like just under 20% of the total agricultural emissions coming from um, in Australian agriculture. So from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's the nitrous oxide emissions that occur during nitrification and also during um, denitrification that have a significant impact on the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. When we look at uh, agricultural N2O in Australia, the emissions, and people might be surprised to see that, but N2O emissions from crop residues are the highest proportion um, of agricultural emission, or N2O emissions across the country, followed by um, nitrogen uh, emissions from nitrogen fertilizer. There's also emissions from the grazing animals, um, from dung and urine, for example. Um, there's also uh, emissions from waste here. And there's these indirect emissions from leaching and deposition of volatilized nitrogen that I referred to earlier. So that emissions from residues um, is, is something that hasn't received a lot of attention. The drivers of nitrous oxide emissions um, well, the ones that come from nitrification, things that favour nitrogen nitrification are warm aerobic soils. Um, and so, but emissions of N2O during nitrification are relatively minor, but can occur over an extended period as long as the warm anaerobic um, conditions persist. Denitrification, on the other hand, can be high when mineral N is high after fertilizer application or particularly nitrate nitrogen is high. And when you've got warm, wet soils with low oxygen availability. So essentially microbes are looking at nitrate as a source of oxygen when soil oxygen availability falls. And those, um, if, it's, if nitrogen is really scarce, uh, sorry, oxygen is really scarce, then those microbes have the potential to take that nitrate all the way through to N2. But if uh, at, when there's lo uh, greater oxygen availability, um, there's a, emissions as N2O. So data on the ratios of N2 to N2O under different um, field conditions are limited, as I mentioned earlier, because the difficulty in trying to measure directly N2 emissions. Inefficient use of nitrogen is a, is a major contributor to nitrous oxide emissions because you typically have excess nitrate N remaining in the soil profile, especially that in surface soil layers where microbial activity is high and where wetting events occur more frequently. 
So the gaseous loss of nitrogen versus soil water is water is obviously a critical component in this. And the previous uh, approach to this has looked at um, water-filled pore space in soil as a predictor of what the um, of what product is likely to be emitted. And the blue hatched areas on the left-hand panel indicate where nitrification is occurring and N2O that's emitted through the nitrification process. As soils get wetter and oxygen availability becomes more limited, you'll see the nitrous oxide emission tends to drop and you tend to see increasing emissions of N2. And then that process is reversed, of course, as oxygen becomes comes back into the soil again. Um, now this is a pretty rough way of predicting what's going on. And we've been recently looking at how soil oxygen availability um, changes with soil water content. And the, the panel on the right is data showing oxygen availability at the beginning of a rainfall event in soil. And that soil got pretty progressively wetter. We had a, a couple of days to dry out and oxygen recovered somewhat and then kept raining. And you can see oxygen availability dropped significantly. Interestingly, even though um, all this is time, the, the x-axis here is time when the soil water content was above field capacity. And you can see that by the original definition, you would expect to see um, that whole process because all that data there is when the soil was wetter than field capacity, but the oxygen availability only really drops when you've got prolonged periods of water logging. And as soon as that soil starts to drain at the other end of the wet event, oxygen comes back very quickly. So we're starting to wonder whether um, oxygen availability rather than soil water content may be a better indicator of denitrification risk. Uh, Peter Grace at QUT has led a, a recent review of um, nitrous oxide emission factors for various industries. It was published late, late last year. Um, previously, Australia has been using default values for nitrous oxide emissions um, from international work. Um, Peter undertook a meta-analysis of something like 290-odd field observations conducted from 2003 to 2021 um, to update the emission factors for the Australian industries. And these emission factors um, are referred to as EF, obviously, and they refer to the percent of the applied nitrogen that's lost as N2O. Now, the numbers you're going to see are fairly small percentages, um, but as we've discussed before, the high global warming percentage of nitrogen ox uh, nitrous oxide makes them really important. I talk to growers a lot, and growers look at the potential losses of nitrous oxide, and they say to me, I spill more than that when I'm filling my fertilizer rig. What are you talking about? Um, but when you actually also say to them that this is also a likely, an, likely an indicator of much higher losses of N2 um, and also is a significant greenhouse gas contributor, um, the significance of this of these findings start to become more apparent. So those the original um, emission factors are shown on the far right hand side of this um, graphic, and you can see that they range from very very low for low rainfall cropping. The previous emission factor was about 0.05 percent of the nitrogen applied was lost as N2O to numbers that can be quite high. You can see here the, um, the sugar cane um, industry or the sugar industry excluding acid sulfate soils. They're looking at roughly 2% of the applied nitrogen lost as nitrous oxide. The revised emission factors um, have gone up and down. You can see the low rainfall numbers have actually increased from 0.05 to 0.29. Um, the higher rainfall areas have remained more or less the same. Um, the, ish, the emission factor for irrigated cropping has dropped somewhat. Cottons remain more or less the same. Sugarcane's dropped a little bit, um, and so has horticulture. And so at least now these uh, emission factors are reflective of Australian data um, that is measured in diverse cropping systems across the country. What does this all mean at the farm scale? Well, uh, in collaboration with Peter, we did some um, gross emission simulations using the Socrates model 
and the nit the revised nitrous oxide efficient uh, emission factors. Um, and if those of you are interested in following up um, with this work, you can look at the the the, rev the web address is shown there. So Peter simulated here three systems: a cotton wheat fallow system, a wheat fallow system, and uh, a continuous crop system with wheat, wheat and grain legume. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the total of the gross um, greenhouse gas emissions expressed as kilograms of CO2 equivalents per hectare. And you can then the different contributors to those emissions are shown. And you'll note here that I've included the uh, emissions for fertilizer manufacture in this graphic. So these, this soil that was used had a 1.5% soil carbon in the top 10 centimetres and which declined with depth. Um, and it was in a 600 millimetre rainfall environment. And these are decadal averages um, of emissions for that for each year. And you can see in the cotton fallow system and in the uh, the cotton wheat fallow system and the, the continuous wheat system with a fallow in between, total emissions are quite large, and they're, but they're dominated by emissions of CO2, which reflect declining soil organic matter that's occurring in those systems. And that declining soil organic matter is linked to uh, the fallow periods during the cropping system, um, which are used to accumulate water. And so during those fallow periods, you're not adding carbon to the soil, the microbes are breaking down soil organic matter, and those CO2 emissions actually dominate um, the total farm emissions per hectare. You can see there's emissions from nitrous oxide in fertilizer, and they're higher in the cotton system where you use more nitrogen fertilizer than you do in a continuous wheat system. Um, the interesting thing um, is that when you look at the more intensive cropping system here on the right-hand side, where you've got annual cropping and inclusion of a legume, the models are actually predicting that you can actually potentially accumulate a small amount of soil carbon in that continuous cropping system. Um, and that when you look at the overall gross emissions, that system is effectively greenhouse gas neutral. Um, now, these are model data, and so I'd like to see a bit more data collected on this, but that sort of um, uh, retention and maintenance of soil organic matter under a continuous cropping system, particularly with winter crops where you've got narrow row spacings and high, higher or better distribution of below ground roots, um, I think is probably fairly realistic. Emissions from fertilizer manufacturer are insignificant in this whole farm emissions. You can see the green figures in here. Um, they are reduced somewhat when you have a legume in that system, obviously, that doesn't require any fertilizer inputs. But compared to emissions from declining soil organic matter and the fertilizers, uh, the nitrous oxide from fertilizer emissions in the field, they're relatively small. The other thing that's worth pointing out is um, projected emissions from uh, residues. And that's the purple color here. And you can see, interestingly, as soon as you put a legume in that system, we've got a higher nitrogen uh, content in the residues, the emissions from residues jump quite sharply. And so it's not all roses, including legumes and cropping systems, when you start considering some of the potential legume uh, emissions from residue decomposition. It's important to remember that these systems here uh, do not consider emissions intensity, which is kilograms of CO2 equivalent per tonne of grain produced, uh, and which is a really important benchmark. So you can actually have high gross emissions at a farm scale, but if you're also extremely productive, then your emissions intensity might be considerably lower than it is on, on some uh, less productive operations. So how can we improve nitrogen use efficiency and reduce N2O emissions at the same time. Well, some this can be challenging. The, the key, the, there are four key steps I've listed here. Firstly, avoiding surplus, surplus nitrate nitrogen in the upper profile layers by trying to match nitrogen supply to crop demand wherever possible. And that's um, 
a critical step from a timeliness process as well as an absolute amount. Secondly, applying nitrogen at a time and place to ensure good crop recovery. And so um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. You can change fertilizer technology. There's next generation fertilizers that are designed to reduce loss risk and better match uh, the release of or the formation of nitrate nitrogen um, in a, to meet crop demand. And also I'll touch on legumes and biologically fixed nitrogen. Matching in supply to demand in rain feed cropping systems is challenging, particularly in stored water systems like the ones we run in Northern Australia, where we use water um, during a growing season and then we accumulate water during a fallow so that we'll be able to crop the next season with some confidence. These systems typically apply their fertilizers or manures in the fallow, late in the fallow or just before sowing. Um, there's no or very limited in-season fertiliser nitrogen application due to the uncertainty of seasonal rainfall. If you throw nitrogen out during a growing season and there's no rain to get that into the root zone, then you've wasted your money. And yield targets are adjusted, or to, to determine the nitrogen inputs are adjusted by seasonal rain forecasts, which are of somewhat limited use at the time of fertiliser decision making. Um, I'm still thinking about that forecast of, a, of a, an El Nino last year and we got one of the wettest summers on record here at Gatton. But this uncertainty about seasonal yield potential can result in either significant yield loss due to under-fertilisation in a growing season or large emissions when in fact you supply nitrogen in excess of that required for yield. And so you can see the exponential increase of nitrogen loss um, as in, in our case, in these clay soils situation through uh, either denitrification as N2 or N2O primarily. The second thing is optimising placement and timing. Um, now, people have traditionally thought of nitrogen as a, as a mobile nutrient, and it is, but in clay soils, it moves slowly. And the two panels I'm showing here illustrate the... Um, the fate of fertilizer nitrogen applied prior to a 2016 winter crop, um, work done by Richard Daniel and the group of North Northern Grower Alliance. They applied 200 kilograms of N per hectare prior to a 2016 crop and then tracked the bulge of nitrate nitrogen over time. Now, they didn't use labeled fertilizers in this instance, which was a bit of a shame, but by tracking the bulge, they used that to track the redistribution of nitrogen over time. And you can see at the McAllister on the, the central Darling Downs, they tracked it over a bit over five years, five crops and nearly 3,000 millimetres of rainfall. And it was only then that we were starting to pick up elevated nitrate below a metre. And in the case of the uh, site of Taluna in northern New South Wales between Gundawindi and Moree, you can see over um, four and a half years and 1,700 millimetres, we still haven't got to a metre. And in fact, in the first two to three years, that nitrogen hadn't got any deeper than 45 to 50 centimetres. So redistribution is slow. Recent work has suggested that some of that slow movement and poor recovery of urea nitrogen in, the, in our clay soils and the vermisols may be a result of fertiliser band application. Uh, in unfertilised soils with distributed mineral nitrogen down through the profile, um, recovery can be very efficient. And the graph, the top graphic says that you can you extract roughly 70% of the mineral nitrogen in the top 90 centimetres of the soil, sorry, top metre 20 of the profile during a growing season. That 70% is far greater than you would get out of fertiliser recovery, which is sitting at typically 20 to 30%. So when you ban nitrogen, you've got poor nitrogen distribution in the field, both vertically and horizontally. And this graphic here on the bottom shows that pretty well, where you look at, we took soil cores on a, on a fertilizer band, uh, in the middle of the inter row next to the fertilizer band, um, on the other side of the crop row and on the other side of the interspace away from the band at the end of a growing season when we had, um, if I recall correctly, in excess of 400 mils of in-crop rainfall. 
And you can see that that fertilizer nitrogen is primarily still in the band position and still in the top 10 centimeters of the soil profile. So despite all that rain, and yes, crops taken up some of that nitrogen, but the residual nitrogen is still sitting in the band position at in the upper profile layers. The reason for the lack of banded movement, um, Chelsea Janke's done some really nice work and published this in 21 and 24, showing some very high in-band concentrations of urea slow the formation of mobile nitrate N, and they actually hold the nitrogen as ammonium. And this graphic, this um, hotspot graphic is showing increasing nitrogen rates from 50 to 100 to 150 kilos of N per hectare. And the, the blobs there are showing the concentration of ammonium nitrogen that you see in the profile. And lower nitrogen rate in the band, that ammonium disappears nitrified fairly quickly and becomes nitrate. The higher the nitrogen rate, the longer that ammonium persists. Um, and so the slower the, the potential movement of nitrate um, deeper in the profile and potentially um, accessed by crop roots in larger soil volumes. To some extent, this retention of ammonium protects against denitrification, but it also limits crop access. And so things like narrower band spacings and lower in-band concentrations might improve this situation. It's a series of multi or multi-year studies originally conducted at Gatton by Manantar et al., um, which is currently in press, um, looking at maize, wheat, uh, well, sorry, maize cropping systems with wheat or faba beans in between, looking at fertilizer nitrogen recovery. Um, you can see most of the nitrogen recovery is in the initial maize crop. And after that, the nitrogen recovery is relatively small. The purple arrows here indicate the amount of loss or the nitrogen that couldn't be accounted for. And it was greater than 30% of the applied N and that most of that loss occurred in the first year with fresh, freshly applied fertilizer. Um, there is still significant residual fertilizer nitrogen in the soil. That's the green component of those stacked bars after 18 months and three crops, but it's relatively minor and the availability of that to subsequent crops hasn't been tested. We're revisiting a lot of this work uh, at Kingsthorpe, um, west of Toowoomba and at Gatton with sorghum and at Tamworth and Wagga and Pampas and Mungandai sites with wheat um, in current projects. The losses, again, clay soils, wet conditions, largely due to denitrification. Um, I make the point here that nitrous oxide has had a lot of attention, but total denitrification losses um, are now a major focus. When you look at data, the two bar charts on the bottom, look at the Colonsay fertilizer um, site run by Insatec Pivot uh, in the central Darling Downs, and in the wet event of 2010-11, and another one in um, January to July 2022, you can see huge amounts of mineral nitrate or largely nitrate nitrogen disappeared from those profiles uh, during that wet event. The majority of that would have gone as N2. Um, and so those losses, when they occur, can be significant and have a large impact on the ability of growers to actually build up a bank of mineral nitrogen in the soil profile. That strategy is currently quite popular in Southern Australia but it's one that's fraught with risk here in the north. Can we get away from banding and broadcast and, and potentially incorporate nitrogen? Will that be any better? Well, we can avoid concentrated bands. However, um, we increase the short-term immobilization of nitrogen by the microbial community. And we also place that nitrogen in the zone of greatest denitrification risk. So the jury's still out in terms of the efficacy of broadcast versus banded applications. Next, can enhanced efficiency fertilizers improve fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency or reduce emissions? We're looking at products that inhibit, inhibit the transformation of urea to ammonium, urease inhibitors. Um, we're looking at ones that um, inhibit the ammonium to nitrate, nitrite and ultra, uh, ultimately nitrate the nitrification inhibitors, or we're looking at controlled release fertilizers that slow the, re the release of urea into the soil. 
Um, we did some work at Gatton um, from 2017 to 2019. It's been reported in a couple of papers where we benchmark performance of these enhanced efficiency products against granular urea, all with banded application. If we looked at the, the, the nitrogen response graph uh, on the right-hand side here, the dark, the dark points show the response to urea, different rates of applied urea, and the colored symbols show the yield response to the different EEFs applied at two rates. And at the suboptimal, the 125 kilo of N rate, no EEFs performed any better than urea. And in fact, the polymer coated urea or the controlled release urea actually released too slowly and caused a yield loss. And when you got it to the higher nitrogen rate, again, there was no difference um, between the EEFs and the, and the urea. Into O emissions, we certainly had a big impact on those. And the, the panel on the bottom left there shows you the nitrous oxide emissions um, when you use a nitrification, sorry, the, for urea at the top um, with a nitrification inhibitor down here or with a polymer coated urea in the middle. And you can see significant reductions in the emissions factors um, with the use of these products. So we lost about one and a half percent of the applied N as urea, um, whereas if we'd used the nitrification inhibitor, those losses had been reduced to under half a percent. Interestingly, later on in the season, we had another look at emissions in spring, and you see all products were emitting nit nitrous oxide in a similar fashion. So the those effects are temporary in terms of their, uh, or, or not, not um, they don't protect nitrogen much beyond the growing season or even part of the growing season. When we looked at the bands and what was going on in the bands, we saw the sort of behavior you would, you would expect, the nitrification inhibitor uh, extends the, the, um, the, or retains more of the nitrogen uh, and the ammonium form. The PCU trickles nitrogen out over an extended period. And the corresponding data for nitrate shows that after um, about 40 odd days, there's next to no nitrogen, uh, nitrate nitrogen in the urea treatment, whereas you can see continuing nitrogen availability, uh, nitrate availability in the top 30 centimetres in both the nitrification inhibitor and the PCU treatment. Was that extra N retained? Um, so presumably if we had lower emissions, we had less loss. Could we see that in the soil at the end of the crop season when you could see excess nitrate nitrogen as nitrogen rates increased in the urea treatment? And if you compared urea with the urease inhibitor, the nitrification inhibitor or the PCU, you can see there's fairly, fairly limited differences um, between uh, the PCU, the ure urease inhibitor was slightly higher than the urea, but the three inhibitors um, or the three EEFs perform quite similarly in terms of residual N. They also impacted the distribution of the nitrogen in the profile. So when you look at urea, roughly 40% of 45% of the nitrogen was, was deeper than the top 30 centimeters, which means there's nitrogen moving down the profile. The urease inhibitor actually had even more than that. 70% of the nitrogen was in deeper profile layers. But when you look at the nitrification inhibitor and the PCU, you can see the majority of that carryover nitrogen is in the top 30 centimetres. And so that's got significant implications for potential loss risk down the track uh, and also for crop recovery. And when we looked at a second maize crop following those treatments, you see that there was no difference between the EEF products and the urea um, at the same um, for the amount of residual nitrate we saw in the profile at sowing versus how much uh, grain yield we got, there was no evidence that EEFs provided greater residual benefits. So that's made us ask the question, are the EEFs reducing total losses or just changing the ratio of N2 to N2O by limiting nitrate availability? And that's a, something that's going to be worked on in future. N2O emission factors with EEFs. Um, again, Peter, Peter included this in his meta-analysis. And if we compare the conventional urea emission factors 
to those where we use a nitrification inhibitor, you see in all situations, there's a significant reduction in that emission factors from use of nitrification inhibitors. If you extend that to look at the polymer coated ureas, for example, or the coated products, um, there's less data, but there's also less obvious effects. So at the moment, nitrification inhibitors or nitrification inhibited fertilizers uh, are about to become a recognized national greenhouse gas mitigation strategy. I guess from my perspective, the fact that we don't recover additional nitrogen um, in the crop itself is, is a concern. We might reduce emissions, but we're not necessarily improving nitrogen use efficiency. There's a current GRDC investment exploring this. Um, UQ are leading the summer crop component of that, where we're going to monitor nitrous oxide emissions from different products. Again, the NIs, the UIs and, the, and blends relative to urea. We've also now got labeled uh, 15N labeled EEF products that we can precisely track the fate of the, of the fertilizer from the EEFs. And I think from an industry perspective, adoption of these products will depend on uh, us being able to show that we can increase crop recovery um, as well as reduce losses because these products are more expensive than the urea and so unless someone's going to pay us for pay growers for reducing nitrous oxide emissions, um, they're unlikely to pay the extra price to get the same crop result out of it. The only industry where we've got an example where the nitrogen savings from use of these products can be captured by the crop is in the sugar industry. And there's a large project reported by Julian Cannell and et al a couple of years ago, which reports that. Finally, biologically fixed nitrogen. I think there's no doubt that residual nitrogen from legumes can reduce fertilizer nitrogen requirements in following crops. Uh, example here from maize grown after faba bean versus maize grown after wheat in the figures showing both biomass and grain yield and also um, nitrogen uptake in those plant tissues. Um, However, that these effects may represent net additions of fixed N or the capture and more synchronous mineralization of soil nitrogen that's occurred during the um, during the legume phase. And so a lot of a lot more work needs to be done in that space. Inefficient use of fertilizer nitrogen by cereals tends to reduce N fixation by following legume crops. And there's a fair bit of work going on in that across the northern grains industry at the moment. And mineralization of organic nitrogen as during a fallow while we're recharging soil water also uh, tends to constrain nitrogen fixation by legumes. We have mentioned greenhouse gas emissions from legume residues. And there's been a nice study done by um, Biz Behera, which is in preparation, looking at nitrous oxide emission emitted from mung bean residues over a winter fallow. And to cut to the chase, essentially, this shows that these are the emission factors in the bottom graph, and it essentially shows that the emission factors for nitrogen in mung bean residues over a fallow were the same or higher than one would have expected from fertilizer nitrogen applied in the same system. So whilst legumes um, can return nitrogen into soil, they don't do it, release nitrogen in a synchronous fashion, and you can end up with saving um, fertilizer nitrogen inputs, but increasing emissions from residues. There's a whole lot of other reasons why you might grow legumes in a cropping system, but I think currently the we've been constrained by a lack of well-adapted stress-tolerant grain legume species for Northern Australia, with the exception of some of the coastal areas. Um, one particular concern by industry is that legumes don't leave enough res residue cover to allow efficient rainfall capture and storage in the subsequent fallow. So is achieving net zero emissions in grain production a pipe dream? Um, I guess there's a conundrum for cropping industries. On one hand, they're being advised to minimize fertilizer nitrogen use, um, which may, may have the opposite effect of what people are advocating because Aside from declining soil organic matter, nitrous, not, while nitrous oxide emissions are important, 
um, declining soil organic matter in our system is dominating greenhouse gas emissions, as that earlier graphic indicated. And reducing um, fertilizer nitrogen inputs will ensure that we certainly don't accumulate any more soil organic matter and are likely to continue that soil organic matter rundown. In rain-fed cropping systems, certainly there is increasing emissions um, as rainfall as you go into wetter environments. There's also increasing emissions as you increase nitrogen fertilizer rates. Um, and you know the ideal of substituting atmospheric fixed, fixed nitrogen from legumes can certainly provide some limited benefits. But on the flip side, we need to increase nitrogen inputs in our cropping system if we're going to meet global food demand. Uh, our grain production systems are all, already nitrogen limited. And as genetic and management options improve productivity potential, they're going to become more so. Grain legumes don't contribute much residual end if they're, if they're being harvested for grain. And harvesting for grain is one of the critical um, successes or success factors that would prompt growers to be able to put these crops into their cropping system. Emissions from residues, especially legumes, have yet to be well quantified, but are likely to be higher than, than those from cereals. And these next generation fertilizers that may be able to be used as with increased fertilizer nitrogen use do not as yet deliver improved crop nitrogen recovery. So there's a bit of work to go in that space. And so to summarize, I think there are no silver bullets in this space. The, the fact that with the greatest impact on fertilizer nitrogen recovery and use efficiency is something that industries can't control. That's the amount and timing of seasonal rainfall. We need to maintain a pool of readily available in the soil to reduce the reliance on seasonal end applications. But if that bank of nitrogen is as nitrate, we increase the vulnerability to infrequent but inevitable La Nina years or even just large wet events. And so in other words, we have large episodic emissions. Slowly building a nitrogen surplus in dry years to maximize productivity when water becomes available is a sound practical strategy for growers, but from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's a risky one. Because again, as I've said, we'll end up with episodic peaks of N2O emissions. And one of the challenges at the moment, I think, is building Australian data sets to underpin best practice nitrogen management for greenhouse accounting. And that's really vital. We need our local, local data specific to our soils and cropping systems before we start making any ma serious management decisions. And with that, I'll hand back to you, Robert. Thanks, Mike, for a great overview of uh, this uh, important topic. Um, time is tight, but we probably have time for one question. There's one in the chat. N2O emission was low when water filled pore space increase. Do you have a trade-off between methane emission and N2O emission relevant to water availability? I guess, what is the net greenhouse gas emission? Yeah. Uh, the old methane emissions. Um, yeah. I guess we, we do see occasional spikes in methane emissions in um, during exceptionally wet periods. They tend to be quite small. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've, Having waterlogged low oxygen soils isn't good for anyone, particularly for plant roots. So it's not a situation that we would we would um, advocate. Certainly, we see a shift to N2 emissions um, and the losses. We've often, I mean, the, the limited data that's around, Peter Grace has done some in irrigated cotton where the ratio of N2 to N2, N2O is something, something like 30 to 40 to 1. So if you lose a kilo of N2O, you're losing 30 to 40 kilos of, N, of N2. And so those losses are pretty significant from an from a end use efficiency point of view. And so avoiding water logging or, or encouraging water logging to minimise N2O emissions, I think would be a fairly risky strategy. Uh, although in some irrigated systems, it no doubt occurs. We might have time for just this one last question. Uh, how do we manage the trade-offs between N2O emissions from cross crop residues and soil health? Hmm. There's some good questions here. Um, I mean, crop, crop residues are an essential part of our system. And I think um, we 
we need to retain residues in this system. I guess at the moment, we've got to try and get a decent handle on what those emissions actually are. I've shown you data from one study. I think there's a couple of studies that Graham Schwenke's done in New South Wales that didn't have a, a zero, uh, a no residue reference point to get the background emissions so that we could actually attribute it to residues. There's a major GRDC investment looking at emissions from residues that's currently being rolled out. So it's looking at things like cereals versus legume um, residues and emissions over a 12 month period. Uh, and so we'll have a far better handle on the size of those emissions relative to other inputs in the cropping system. At the moment, we're speculating. I guess there's an assumption, for example, that legumes are a free lunch in terms of reducing fertiliser and inputs and reducing emissions. I think the, the data that we have got from legumes suggests that that may not be the case and that where we, we save on fertiliser, nitrogen inputs and those losses, we may actually... Um, um, counter that by having increased emissions from residues. So um, I think that the key point to me out of all this is that growers have got to maximise productivity. If you're maximising productivity, you've got the best potential opportunity to increase soil organic matter. You've got to put nutrients in to do that. And if you're putting nutrients in, you've also got the potential to increase soil organic matter. And that's the labile nitrogen pool that we really need to build up in our systems. At the moment, the only data I've seen that shows we can build soil organic matter is when we convert back to pastures. Uh, and, you know, that's not going to feed too many people in the longer term. So, Thanks very much, uh, Mike. We're, we're probably going to have to draw it to, to an end there because we're a little bit over time. But thanks again for your talk. And I think if we look at the next slide... Um, we do that. Sure. Yes. I just thank Sorry. everyone for um, this is the one we need. Thank ah. everyone for attending our science seminar today. And if you haven't already signed up to our seminar invitation, please scan the the QR code that you've got here, or or go to the uh, website that's indicated there. Um, thanks everyone, and uh, bye until next time.